Hi, this is Travis Shaw with the Mosby Heritage Area Association, and today I'll be talking about a subject that I think is pretty fun, um, something that you folks can follow along with at home, and that is the history of drinking and alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages in America. And really, I'm going to focus today on the 18th century and the early 19th century. So we'll talk about the history of alcohols in America. We'll talk about you know how it's produced, how it's consumed, and then. Most fun of all, I'll actually be sharing a few of my favorite recipes, uh, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic, that you'll be able to make at home. So when we talk about drinking in America, it's very, very important to point out that particularly with alcohol, alcohol consumption in America was much higher in historic periods than it is today. Um, alcohol was pervasive at all levels of society, at all age groups. Um, and it really peaks in America around 1830. Um, and around that time, the average American is consuming six to seven gallons of pure alcohol a year. Um, now, I'd like to point out, not only is that three times the amount that the average American consumes today, but we're talking pure alcohol. So that's, you know, if we think of a beer as around 5% alcohol, um, this is kind of stripping that out and saying, no, six to seven gallons of alcohol per year. Um, it's really a staggering amount and it really puts into perspective the temperance movements that start to arise around that time. You know, alcohol consumption is seen as a massive societal ill. It's seen as something that's tearing families apart, that literally is killing people. Um, you know, a good modern analog to that is, you know, kind of what we've seen over the past few years with the opioid epidemic, um, particularly in rural America. You know, this is a problem that is absolutely destroying communities. So um, alcohol consumption will peak around that time. It will actually fall steadily from, from the early 19th century um, to its level today, which is about roughly two gallons of pure alcohol per person in America. Um, now, breaking down the types of alcohol consumed historically, um, again, we have broad categories that we still have today. We'll start with beers and ciders, um, kind of the most ubiquitous drinks in early America um, because they're produced locally, they're kind of produced for everyday consumption. This is the kind of thing that you would drink at your table with a meal, um, not necessarily the kind of thing that you would break out if company was coming over. Um, Initially, the beer styles that we're going to see in early America are those brought by colonists, um, particularly English style beers, things like uh, porters, porters are very popular, um, ales, and then gradually, as more and more German immigrants come, particularly in the middle of the 19th century, German styles are going to take over, um, particularly lagers. And if we think to many of the massive breweries that we have in this country today, places like Anheuser-Busch and St. Louis, um, Coors, uh, Paps, all these breweries kind of date back to those, uh, the German immigration in the middle 19th century. Um, and their style of beer, you know, kind of Pilsners and Lagers are going to become the preferred style of beer by the time of the Civil War. Um, many of these beers are going to be produced with locally grown grains, you know, wheat, um, barley, rye sometimes appears, um, although sometimes they will be augmented by different ingredients. Um, one of my favorite ones um, to talk about is nowadays when you go to a beer store in October, you're going to see pumpkin beers, you know, flavor with kind of the pumpkin spice cloves and cinnamons and things like that. Um, pumpkin beers do exist, Back in colonial America, um, pumpkin pie flavor is not really what they're going for. Instead, they're actually using a dried pumpkin or dried squash to provide the sugar for the fermentation. So it doesn't have that wonderful pumpkin pie flavor that people expect today. Um, another agent that's often used in brewing, particularly in the 18th century, is spruce. Um, spruce tips from you know, spruce trees would be mixed with molasses and allowed to ferment. Um, this is gonna play a critical role, believe it or not, in the Revolutionary War period. Um, the vitamin C in the spruce beer would actually prevent scurvy. So spruce beer was often issued to troops historically during the Revolutionary War period. Um, not definitely an acquired taste, not one of my favorite beers uh, today. Um, Ciders, of course, are going to be drank alongside beers, again, as an everyday sort of drink. Um, here in Northern Virginia, in the Piedmont, 
Uh, apple orchards are going to be everywhere on the landscape. You know, the, the lower Shenandoah Valley is still to this day known for its apple production. And much of the, the apple production was going to be put into fermenting ciders, again, as a cheap kind of everyday drink. Um, now I say everyday, beer and cider are gonna be consumed by every level of society, every age group. Um, there are what are known as small beers, beers with very, very low alcohol contents. Um, that's going to be given to children. Um, it's going to be drank at breakfast. We're, we're talking, you know, close to today's non-alcoholic beers where there's still just a little bit of alcohol in, in them. Um, but those are going to be drank kind of through every age group. Um, beer was seen as just an everyday thing the same way that we would reach for a soda or something like that today. Uh, up on the kind of higher rungs of society, though, you are going to see a lot of wine consumption. Um, wine is being grown in America or produced in America. Grapes are being grown. Uh, most famously, Thomas Jefferson is going to attempt to, to create a vineyard there at Monticello. Uh, but we don't really see the successful wine industry in America that we see today, particularly in, in Virginia. Instead, what we're gonna see is the importation of a lot of wines. And if the wine is going to uh, have to make that transatlantic voyage, um, the styles that we see most commonly during the historic period are going to be fortified wines, wines that can kind of make that voyage without spoiling or going bad. Um, particularly Portuguese wines, Port and Madeira are both exceptionally popular, um, particularly with the higher classes. Uh, Madeira, for instance, was George Washington's drink of choice, and he would buy it by the case, go through it by the bottle um, on regular occasions. Um, but really, it's going to be those kind of sweet, what we think of today as sweet fortified wines are going to be the most popular styles uh, until, you know, again, kind of the 20th century. Um, that leaves us with probably the most ubiquitous alcoholic drink of the, the historic period, and that, are, that is liquor or spirits. Um, whiskey is being produced in Virginia in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, much like it still is today. We have a number of wonderful distilleries in our heritage area that are still carrying on this tradition. Uh, in the historic period, the most popular grain, particularly in Maryland and Virginia, is rye. Uh, rye whiskeys are going to be the favored style in this region, um, so much so that by the 19th century, um, Maryland and Virginia are going to be considered, you know, rye whiskey is going to be considered as important to those areas as bourbon will be to Kentucky. Um, it's kind of the stamp of approval to have a Maryland rye or a Virginia rye. Um, that is going to be particularly popular. Um, the rye is sometimes augmented with things like corn. Um, even malted barleys are going to be thrown into the mash bill, um, but rye will be the predominant grain, whereas as we go west into western Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Tennessee, then corn will become the preferred grain for distilling. Um, not only is rye whiskey going to be made in this area, but fruit brandies will also be incredibly popular. Going back to those uh, orchards that dominated the landscape in the 18th and 19th century, um, those fruits are also going to be distilled. Apple brandies, peach brandies, pear brandies will all be incredibly popular. But the most popular liquor of all in 18th and 19th century America is going to be rum. Rum is absolutely ubiquitous across the colonies, across the young United States. It will be the liquor of choice um, up until, you know, into the, the early 19th century. Um, and there's a good reason for this. It is cheap. It is easy to produce. It's being produced here in the colonies. Um, so most of the rum production will not happen here in Virginia necessarily. It's going to happen in large urban cities, places like Philadelphia, um, New York, and most particularly New England. New England is tied into uh, the triangular trade, this trade network that we've all learned about in our, our middle school history classes. Uh, wherein New England seafarers and shipbuilders are going to carry rum, manufactured goods, tools, guns, things like that, to Africa in exchange for enslaved people, um, bring those enslaved Africans to the West Indies. Um, they're also going to carry things like Virginia grown grain, Virginia um, salted fish, preserved fish, livestock, um, 
lumber and barrel staves, things that the West Indies colonies need in order to produce sugar and in order to feed and clothe those enslaved populations. Um, and in exchange for bringing this to the West Indies, they're going to pick up sugar and molasses, which will then be taken back north and distilled into rum. So New England rum kind of flows freely throughout the colonies and throughout early, the early Republic. Um, now, all of these liquors, the whiskeys, the brandies, the rums, um, could be drank straight, they could be watered down, or they could be made into any number of cocktails. Um, and these range from the extremely simple. Um, one of the simplest is simply called the Stone Fence, which is a mixture of hard cider and rum. Um, terrible headache afterwards. Um, or they can be incredibly complex. Um, some of the more popular um, cocktails during this time are syllabubs and possets, both of which use alcohol, um, sometimes citrus juice, various spices, along with milk. Um, and that milk will then curdle, it will be frothed up into kind of a foamy concoction. Um, nowadays, we don't tend to think of milk or eggs as things that you would put into a cocktail. But in the 18th and 19th century, this is incredibly common. Um, a good example of how this legacy lives on is in eggnog. You know, eggnog is the prototypical kind of 19th century American cocktail. It involves rum, brandy, whiskey, mixed with cream, mixed with eggs, mixed with nutmeg and other spices. Um, so that's very typical of this kind of tradition of syllabubs and possets. Um, sometimes those drinks would even be served warm. Um, there's a, a class of drink called flip which is kind of very similar, same ingredients, except it's heated up with a hot iron and kind of frothed up into a, to a hot spiced drink. Um, but the absolute king of historic cocktails is going to be punch. Punch comes in thousands of different varieties. Every tavern, every home, every family has their own punch recipes. Um, they, they are ubiquitous. Now, punch is typically a celebratory drink. Um, it's the kind of thing you bring out um, when people get married, when there's an election, when you're celebrating some sort of special event. Um, and it is a very communal drink. And we'll talk about why that is after we make a bowl of it. Um, now, just like all these other cocktails, punch can be very simple or it can be very complex. Uh, one of the more complex recipes I've seen comes from the Prince Regent of England at the end of the 18th century. His punch recipe calls for um, brandy, calls for rum, calls for the, the juice of three or four different citrus fruits, um, has green tea and champagne in it. Um, I've never recreated the recipe, but it sounds really good. One of these days, maybe we'll have to celebrate. Um, but the basics of punch are very simple. Every punch has some sort of alcohol. Um, typically, it is rum. Um, initially, before rum became the favorite alcohol, you would see a, a liquor called Batavian Arak, which is a rum-like drink that comes from the Dutch East Indies, what is now Indonesia. Um, but gradually, New England rum, West Indies rum becomes cheaper, and so people will turn to that. It includes water. Um, typically, the alcohol and water are mixed in equal proportions. It's going to have some sort of sugar in it. It's going to typically have some sort of citrus fruit in it, lime juice, lemon juice, orange juice, um, and it will also have spices. Um, nutmeg seems to be the most common. And, and what I really enjoy about punch from a historic perspective is it's a very, in my mind, imperial drink. It, it's symbolic of the kind of trade connections that exist in the 19th century, in the 18th century. You're seeing, you know, rum either from the East Indies or from New England. You're seeing sugar, which comes from the West Indies, you know, grown through that enslaved labor. You're seeing um, citrus fruits, which come from the West Indies or come from Africa or come from Southern Europe. Um, spices, again, from the East Indies or from India, from the Caribbean. All of these things are being carried together on these massive transnational, transoceanic trade networks to 18th century America and 19th century America. And this is something that people of, of almost every level of society are gonna have punch at various points in their life. So it really is emblematic of that. Um, it gets even crazier if you start adding things like tea, 
like French brandies or cognacs. Um, so it really is a worldwide drink, um, which makes it even more remarkable because this is something that, as I said, is so common throughout every level of society, from people on the frontier to people living in you know, the biggest cities in America are going to be drinking punch. Um, now, punch is traditionally made in a bowl. Um, I, to my shame, do not have a good historic punch bowl, so I'm gonna be using this bowl here today, just kind of a serving bowl. And the punch bowl is meant to be passed around. You pass it around the room, everyone kind of takes a sip. I don't recommend doing that while there's a global pandemic going on, um, unless you know your, your fellow party goers really well. Um, but you read historic accounts of just staggering numbers of punch bowls being consumed at parties. There's a, a letter I was reading that was talking about a new minister coming to the community. And so they throw a, a big celebration and the town drinks 30 bowls of punch. Um, there's another, a similar story from the Constitutional Convention, where again, they go through dozens of bowls of this stuff. Um, so I'm going to share the easiest punch recipe, kind of think of this as a base, and then you can expand on it however you like, you know, kind of add things as you, you like them. Um, so we're going to start with water. Um, I'm going to mix equal proportions of water and rum. So we've got rum, or water. We have rum. Um, now, typically you use a dark rum. Uh, my favorite rum is, is Mount Gay rum from Barbados, so maybe they'll give us a, a sponsorship. But uh, any sort of dark spiced rum is great. Um, typically mixed in equal proportion or roughly equal to the water. Now, I will post the recipes in the comments below, so you'll be able to see it there. Um, now, in proportions, we're gonna have about a if that's one part rum and one part water, about a quarter part citrus. This is lemon and lime juice right here. And an eighth part sugar. Kind of any sugar will do, brown sugar, white sugar. Um, give that a good stir. Do my best to be a child. And then I'm gonna to top that with some freshly grated nutmeg. Now, again, um, I just made a big old bowl of punch. Punch is meant to be shared. Um, these are the basic proportions, but again, you can add anything you'd like. A lot of punch recipes call for mixing rum and brandy together as the alcoholic base. You might see orange juice instead of lime juice, lemon, lime. I'm gonna throw a few slices of lemon and lime here on the top, just kind of for show. And there we have it. This is a basic punch. I'll hold it up to the camera there, ready to be consumed. Um, I prefer punch chilled, so you might want to throw some ice in there or let the ice melt down to kind of water it down. If you experiment with the base, you'll kind of figure out what works best for you. Um, let's give it a go. Be your health, everyone. That is a good basic punch recipe right there. Now, we've talked a lot about alcohol. Of course, alcohol is not the only thing being consumed in America in the 18th and 19th century. Um, there are a, a plethora of non-alcoholic drinks. Um, now, of course, water is the most obvious. Um, most people living in rural areas have access to clean water. You see a lot of spring houses, a lot of you know wells and things like that. Um, but in urban areas where human waste and other pollution has built up, water is not always safe. And we see tainted water lead to outbreaks of horrible diseases like cholera in the historic period. So you can kind of see why water is often mixed with other things to make it more palatable um, and you know, unbeknownst to them necessarily, they didn't have germ theory, but it also tends to make it safer to consume. Um, milk, you would think, would be a popular drink in the historic era, but it's not consumed as often as, as one would expect. It's more often seen as an ingredient for cooking or for making cocktails. Now, I talked about syllabubs and things like that, milk punches. Um, the big drinks that are non-alcoholic during this time period are going to be three that we still have with us today. Um, tea, tea is obviously more popular before the American Revolution than after. Um, but even after the revolution, it will maintain some degree of popularity. Um, coffee. 
Um, the first coffee shop in America that we know of um, was established in Maryland in the 1600s. And it is going to be extremely popular, um, particularly in urban areas. Um, some of you may have seen the reconstructed coffee shop in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, coffee shops, just like today, are kind of a place where people go to meet other people, hang out, discuss the news, discuss the ideas of the day, um, and they're going to become incredibly important as we head towards the American Revolution. This is a place where ideas are exchanged, and many of the revolutionary ideas or enlightenment ideas are kind of thrown around. Um, so coffee, extremely popular. After the revolution, it becomes a staple of American life, and we're going to see that particularly during the Civil War, you know, as the South is blockaded, access to coffee from overseas is going to be cut. And so people are going to start um, kind of augmenting coffee with all sorts of other different ingredients to try and stretch that coffee out. And the, the biggest lasting legacy of that is going to come with chicory coffee, which is still extremely popular in the Deep South. Um, roasted chicory root was used as a way to kind of simulate the idea of coffee um, when coffee was not able to be had. Um, Things like roasted acorns, roasted peas, burnt peanuts are going to be used again to try and, and recreate that um, to varying degrees of success. Um, the third very, very popular hot drink in this era is actually going to be chocolate. It's kind of one that we don't necessarily think about, but chocolate is going to be consumed in colonial America, in 19th century America, most often not in the form of candy, chocolate bars, but in the form of a drink. Um, and just like today, that chocolate would be ground up into a fine powder. It would be melted into hot water or hot milk or even hot wine. And then it would be flavored with all sorts of agents. Things like sugar, very popular, cloves and cinnamon will be put in, um, chili powder. Um, all of these are going to be used to flavor drinking chocolate. Now, my absolute favorite historic non-alcoholic drink, the one that I'm going to be sharing with you today, is not meant to be drank hot. It's actually meant to be drank cold as a refreshing beverage uh, when you've been outside on a hot summer day, and that is Switchel. Um, Switchel, also known as Haymaker's Punch, is a non-alcoholic type of punch. Um, as the name suggests, Haymaker's Punch, it's very popular with agricultural laborers. And it's essentially going to fill the role of like a, a 18th, 19th century Gatorade or Powerade. It's not only a refreshing drink, but it's going to help restore some of the electrolytes and salts and things that in your body that you've sweat out. So I'm going to make a small batch of it, but I'll post a recipe uh, along the comments of this video where you can make a full batch. So very, very simple. The base ingredient is going to be water. I have like a pint of water here. Vinegar, this is just apple cider vinegar. That's gonna go into the water. And I usually make this in a much, much bigger batch, but this is the, the small batch. Molasses, and if you're going to make this, use unsulfured molasses. Um, make sure to check the jar. Molasses is gonna add sweetness, it's gonna add calories, it's going to add um, some of those kind of salts and electrolytes that your body is looking for. And lastly, ginger. And this is just simply powdered ginger. So all of that is going to go into my glass here. Now, to the modern palate, the idea of drinking vinegar, drinking molasses might seem kind of strange. But I've introduced a lot of people to this drink. It is not as nasty as it sounds. Um, and it is exceptionally refreshing on a hot day. Um, and I was recently made aware that Turkey Hill, the convenience store chain in Pennsylvania, actually sells this in their like coolers and their, their convenience stores. Um, they call it Haymaker, um, but it's the same principle. Now, again, there are a million different switchel recipes. Some call for different ingredients, but they all tend to share, you know, water, molasses, vinegar. Um, I like the ginger. It gives it a good flavor. And again, it helps kind of give it that refreshing taste. So. You're out there working on your lawn this summer. You're out there outside sweating. Switchel is a great way to refresh yourself and it's a really fun historic way to refresh yourself. So I hope you've enjoyed this discussion today. Um, I hope you take some of these recipes that I'm gonna post in the comments, try them out, let us know what you think. 
Um, if you find a really good combination that works well, please let us know. Um, as always, thank you for joining us. Um, please continue to support the Mosby Heritage Area Association by visiting our website at mosbyheritageareaorg or liking and following us on Facebook and Instagram. So here's to your health. Thank you.